Hello everyone and welcome to that third and last video about the history of prehistory. Let's go! So after the discovery of the engraved mammoth of La Madeleine and the general acceptance of the existence of ancient men, Les Aisy village and the vicinity will soon become the mecca of prehistoric excavations. Contrary to what we could imagine, the communication and general democratization of the subject have started within the first years of that field. During what can clearly be named the century of progress, the press was scrupulously following and covering all of the discoveries, and at times gladly took part for either side of a theory. The Universal Exhibitions or World Fairs also played a great part because before Museum of Prehistory or Anthropology became a thing, they were often the only place where the public could see the artifacts. We've already talked about the 1867 World Fair, but let's not forget the 1889 World Fair, which on top of inaugurating Gustav Eiffel's tower, was presenting an exhibition around the daily life of the Paleolithic people. They were admired very enthusiastically, among other things, because they displayed people and objects that were of French heritage. That type of nationalist sensibility will be used some years later as a commercial argument by Liebig. In order to keep selling their shit, basically, without suffering from the anti-German stigma, they will appeal to the national sensibility with a campaign surfing on the Paleolithic figure. Literature also followed the trend by issuing several novels that romanticized this period, like for example L'Homme Primitif or La Guerre du Feu. In this context, serious scholars, as well as unscrupulous treasure hunters, sometimes both at the same time, joined with locals happy to make a buck to excavate the crap out of Dordogne. It's the prehistoric rush. At the time, there was no legislation regarding the prehistoric heritage besides the law of property. The landlords of the outcrops were thrilled to rent or sell the parcels they did not use and sometimes be bribed a little bit. The prehistorians were thrilled to pay the locals to excavate. And the local workers were thrilled to actually find work when the Industrial Revolution had condemned most of them to poverty by closing numerous manufacturers. Everybody had the archaeological fever and locals started digging everywhere, in their property, under their houses, and a real antiques traffic took place in broad daylight. The renowned prehistorians themselves did not hesitate selling countless artifacts in order to finance their next excavation. In 1906 came in a new player, the infamous Otto Hauser. Swiss-German antique dealer, Protestant, but everybody believed he was Jewish. He graduated in classical literature, history and archaeology in Baal, and he was sincerely interested in prehistory. When he arrived in Les Aisy, he got organized pretty fast, and he brought this antiques commerce to an almost industrial level, renting or buying over 30 sites, paying his workers more than anyone else, communicating and dealing with the potential buyers, museums, private collectors ahead of time. He bought the ancient hotel of the train station of Les Aisy, renamed it Hotel Cro-Magnon in reference to the very site of Cro-Magnon right next to it, and welcomed his tourists there. He edited postcards, outcrop maps, touristic maps, opened a restaurant and an exhibition sales room in Loge Riot next to his house. 
As a successful entrepreneur, of course, he was going to be hated. And now that we know the reason behind the hatred, let's have a look at the pretext. His methods weren't the most precautious, rigorous or scientific. He was mostly interested in the result and the artifact value. But to be fair, almost all of them were like that at the time, and he actually got results. In 1907, while excavating in Le Moustier, he came by the first Neanderthal skull ever found in France. With his sense of communication, he had the nerve to put it back where he had found it and rediscover it in front of an audience several times. A bit like a sniffing dog in a truffle farm, which is something we have quite a bit here too. Other important discovery by Hauser? The skeleton of Comte Capel in 1909. This time it's a sapiens. It turns out from more recent analysis that he was Mesolithic and not Paleolithic. And he dared selling both these human skeletons to the Ethnological Museum of Berlin. Now let's be clear, even though it's perfectly natural to frown upon seeing your national heritage being sold away to foreigners, everybody was doing that at the time. It was a very common practice. For instance, Louis Didon sold the Magdalenian skeleton of Cap Blanc and a beautiful sculpted horse to the Museum of National History in New York. But between the War of 1870 and the premise of the upcoming Great War, the anti-German feeling was stronger than ever. And selling to Berlin was an offense, especially by a man with a strong Germanic accent, a bit megalomaniac, and who acts like he's in conquered territory and who succeeds very well at that. It's the start of a campaign of vilification the press participated in. Even Breuil will write about him. Quote, a Swiss treasure hunter has laid his hands on the most important outcrops in Les Aisy, and this individual is well known in Swiss for scams, countless hoax, and bad behavior. He has no scruples and no morality. He comes here to industrially exploit without any gain for science, just for money." End quote. Now we have all the ingredients to understand l'affaire du poisson. 1912, Jean Marsan identifies on the ceiling of the rock shelter a superb life-size salmon sculpted in the rock. It's quite exceptional as it is because fish to this day are extremely rare in the Paleolithic art. And besides the fish, it turns out the whole ceiling was a complex work of art with traces of pigments. Very soon, the Museum of Berlin seeks to acquire it and sends emissaries to seal the deal. The bargaining begins with the owner and a handful of the local elders. But in order to protect the salmon that was about to be extracted in the most barbarous manner, without any consideration for the rest of the decoration, some prehistorians such as Denis Peyroni wreaked havoc in order to pass a law protecting the prehistoric heritage. The law of 1913 protected the fish just in time, and it's a good thing too. But as much as Hauser himself had no part in this story whatsoever, the real culprits kept a low profile and everybody else was more than happy to get rid of him, make him the scapegoat, seize all his belongings and send him back to where he came from. I know I sound biased, well I am, because the story rings so many bells. In any case, after Hauser disappeared from the picture, this law of 1913 wasn't such a blessing for the remaining prehistorians who weren't so happy to see their freedoms restricted in search of prehistoric artifacts. We've mentioned the discoveries of Hauser in Le Moustier and Comte Capel, as well as the Magdalenian skeleton of a female in the Cap Blanc shelter. 
One of the most important findings of the time was made the same year as Le Moustier's adolescent in August 1908. La Chapelle au Saint in Corrèze. The Buissonni brothers found a whole Neanderthal skeleton in fetus position, so buried in a grave. It was the first complete Neanderthal skeleton and for once found with all the necessary care in the archaeological context which enabled to date him approximately 60,000 years old. The Catholic journal La Lanterne will lash out on the Buissoni brothers for being clergymen themselves and still giving arguments in favor of the evil evolutionists. Marcelin Boulle will analyze the skeleton of this Neanderthal with scrutiny and as a result he will come up with a very pejorative description of the Neanderthal men which will influence uh, our vision of them for generations. Brutal, unable to walk properly or fully stand up. Turns out he was right about that individual who was old and plagued with arthritis, but not about the others. As for Denis Peyroni and Louis Capitan, who will excavate in La Madeleine for many years, they will discover in 1926 a full skeleton of a four-year-old Magdalenian boy. He had been buried with a very sophisticated seashells ornament and associated with a lot of objects, including the worldly famous bison licking its flank. It's a good transition to get to our last point, the notion of art in the Paleolithic times. So, multiple objects of art had been found between the end of the 19th century and the early 20th. Venuses, engraved plagues, sculptures of animals, etc. There are no certitudes regarding the uh, mentality or lifestyle of the Paleolithic people. But how not to be amazed by the quality of their art, their sense of proportion, observation, representation or even abstraction? It's almost modern. Isn't it in contradiction with the image of savages that would drag their women by the hair? As a result, several theories try to bring an explanation. A. The theory of the good savage, à la Rousseau. In Larte's opinion, um, these children of nature escaping the need to work or to conform to a society had all the time in the world to create art for art's sake, just for the beauty of it. B. According to Salomon Reynard, they were most probably more smart or capable than we give them credit for. And he was right. But he adds that their art is purely naturalist in its representation and is deprived of depth of symbolism. And in that he was probably wrong. C. It's a hoax. According to a lot of people, there was just no such thing as Paleolithic art. It just couldn't exist. And to their credit, we have to admit that there have been many, many hoax in this field ever since the beginning. Some people planted fake artifacts in excavation sites, sometimes for commercial purposes or sometimes simply to discredit the archaeologists. And because of that, the official recognition of Paleolithic art or cave art lost several years. Discovered, sealed in 1868 by a local, it's gonna draw the attention of the naturalist Marcelino Sanz de Sautuola. He's very interested in prehistory and prospecting in caves. In 1879, while taking his daughter with him on an exploration of the cave, young Maria notices on the wall the painting of a toro. It wasn't a toro, but a bison, and from that moment on, Sautuola will take his eyes away from the floor to look at the walls and ceilings. To his amazement, there are more than one bison, as well as other animals and carvings. He sensed right away that they could be the work of prehistoric people. 
and for several reasons. A, before he entered the cave, it was sealed, most probably for thousands of years. B, the majority of the animals that are represented do not even exist in Spain, but have during the last ice age. C, who would have had the ludicrous idea to lock themselves in a semi-obscure cave and paint extinct animals that no one could ever see? D, all of the materials involved, uh, sharp tools for carvings or pigments for paintings, were abundant in the direct area and ever since the Paleolithic. All fair points. Yet, no material evidence supported his guess in this period and sadly for him, no one believed him. In France, his theory met some skepticism and here's why. At the time, as we already mentioned, even the evolutionists had some sort of notion of progress in their minds and to them, the Paleolithic people were nothing but primitives, almost animals, who would never have been able to create such a refined art. Because of a large number of hoax, prehistorians were very cautious, and in this case, Spain being super Catholic compared to post-revolutionary France, they feared a sort of Jesuit hoax to discredit altogether all of the discoveries of the prehistoric community. Because Saotuola was alone with a child when the discovery occurred, he was considered the only witness, which made him suspect, and he will be accused of making the paintings himself. His credibility and integrity will be forever doubted until his death. Finally, the question of the lighting. Indeed, impossible to paint so, so beautifully and so many subjects in a semi-obscure cave without any lighting. So, because they did not find any trace of smoke or soot on the walls, they deduced that only a modern lighting could have been used. But within a few years, in the course of the 1890s, three more painted caves were to be discovered in France. La Moutte, Père-Mon-Père and Marsoulas. They will provide the evidence that Altamira did not for poor Sautuola. <laughs> One, Altamira is no longer unique, therefore it's no longer suspect. Two, there are strong similarities in the choice of animals and the type of representation. Three, although the French caves have essentially carvings and not paintings, it does make a bridge with all the carved art that had already been found on numerous supports, so why not on walls? Four, in Père Mon Père, some of the artwork has only been discovered after clearing the archaeological deposit, first proving by stratigraphy the authenticity. Five, finally, La Moutte provided the answer to the question of the lighting. They found in the excavation a stone lamp dated from the Magdalenian. And this stone lamp is obviously contemporaneous to the work on the walls because it was engraved with an ibex similar to that on the walls. In 1901, the authentication of the caves of Combarel and Font de Gaume will officialize the existence of cave art. Too bad for poor Sautuola, who died in 1888. In 1902, Emile Cartayac, one of the most serious contradictors of Sautuola, will write and pronounce publicly the mea culpa of a skeptic. One must yield to the reality of a fact. As for me, I must make amends. Our youth believed it knew everything, but the discoveries of Dalot, Rivière, Capitan and Breuil demonstrate that our science, as the others, is writing a story that will never end. Other caves will be discovered in the 20th century, and not just in France. And then, in 1940, when no one was expecting it, four teenagers discovered Lascaux, which became instantly a national treasure. And in 1994, when it was even less expected, 
the extraordinary cave of Chauvet was discovered, and it's arguably even more remarkable than Lascaux. Yet, it's nearly 20,000 years older. As Emile Cartayac said it, this story is not over. Each year brings new discoveries. The dates keep going backwards. The theories evolve at the same time as the techniques get more sophisticated and accurate. It's only the beginning and it's exciting. Anyway, thank you for having followed us in this incredible adventure of the history of prehistory. We hope you stay tuned for more content. We really enjoyed doing it. We thought it was a fascinating subject. Thank you for the few people who have written comments, comments sorry, or thumbs up. It's always appreciated as little as it is. Thank you all and see you next time.